The event that we had was centered around a manuscript we have in the music library, which is a, a fugue, uh, unpublished, never before performed by uh, Maurice Ravel. This is really a very exciting event, not only for Northwestern, but also for French music scholars, uh, because it's the first world premiere of a Ravel piece since 1975. So this was a real opportunity to take this fugue and transcribe it, make it available for performers to interpret and deliver in a concert setting. Just like our students here in the Bean School of Music who have to, you know, do counterpoint exercises and, and all those things that many of them dread, uh, it's the same situation for Ravel. He was, you know, a music student himself in his 20s at the time that he wrote this, around the age of 22. It gives our, our, our students an immediate link to a major composer in the early days when he was beginning to refine his technique. And since the manuscript has some corrections on it, that just adds to it. That's just icing on the cake because most music theory students who turn in their fugues receive them back with corrections on them. All four of us wrote things like that in our music theory classes or things like that, or counterpoint classes. And, you know, it's interesting to see like what one of the great composers would have put down on in that situation. The manuscript was acquired from a, a dealer that I work with uh, in London, who's a, a specialist in, in uh, music antiquarian materials. We're fortunate to have some endowments specifically for music materials. Not very long after we acquired the manuscript, I had a knock on my door, and uh, the gentleman on the other side of the door introduced himself as Keith Clifton. I was here doing some research and um, called me into his office and said, you know, I have something that you might want to see because I, I wrote my dissertation here at Northwestern on Ravel's first opera. This was a, a great opportunity uh, for, for both of us, I think, because really the manuscript hadn't been seen yet. We hadn't had it for very long. I certainly had looked it over uh, quite a bit, but I, it hadn't been in the hands of anyone who really was an authority on Ravel's music. And so he showed me the manuscript and said, you know, well, first of all, do you confer that this is Ravel's writing? And I said, absolutely, it is. I knew immediately it was Ravel for uh, a couple of reasons. First of all, I've been fortunate enough to personally examine a number of the, the major Ravel manuscripts, especially in, in holdings in the United States. From that, knowing his manuscript, knowing his distinctive way of, of writing, I was able to determine that that was his. So in the course of that initial meeting, uh, the idea for perhaps performing the piece, premiering it at Northwestern came up, and one thing led to another. Well, perhaps then if we do that, then we should publish it. And so we've been, we've been considering this idea for a few years. It, it didn't happen until now, until we had this opportunity. This piece was written, I believe, just a couple of years before Ravel competed for a very important composition prize called the Rome Prize, the Prix de Rome. And he was a contestant for that prize on five different occasions and never managed to win it, which was a huge scandal. The preliminary round, the contestants had to do two things. They had to write a four-voice fugue based on a given subject, a given musical theme, and they had to compose a choral piece. And so the fugue, the F minor fugue, is an example of Ravel sort of gearing up for what he was going to be doing over the course of roughly the next decade in competing for the Rome Prize. So Ravel was working within, you know, a very specific type of, of language in writing the F minor fugue, and it would affect what he would do later on. It gives us a really rare glimpse of a composer at the beginning of his career, and it shows us a lot about his working process and the way that he takes musical material, you know, in, in many cases a very simple musical idea and creates an entire piece out of it. It's a very important example of the foundational work that Ravel did that would lead to his later compositions. The Music Library's collection is extraordinarily strong in 20th century music. Not having an original work by Ravel 
was a gap and in representing the work of a major composer from, from the late 19th and early 20th century, and really a composer whose influence remains incredibly strong today. Most composers, maybe all composers today, can't really approach an orchestra, can't really write for orchestra without first dealing with Ravel or having a sense that the ghost of Ravel is looking over their shoulder because of all the innovative things Ravel did with the orchestra. They remain very relevant today. The piece doesn't specify instrumentation. It's, a, it's an academic fugue or a school fugue, and so it, it's written in four voices. It wasn't written for a string quartet, and in fact, it could be transcribed for any number of instrumentations. The string quartet worked nicely for a variety of reasons. Each of the, the lines of the fugue fit very well within violin, viola, and cello. The ranges of the instruments fit the ranges of the fugue itself, and we have such a fine string program here that it just it seemed like a a good idea to use them. Having the piece performed by a string quartet by four individuals, you're able to track uh, orally. You can hear the voices uh, perhaps better as they're interacting. And certainly in a live performance, you can see, you can, you can hear with your eyes what's going on. premiere performance was truly a collaboration between the library and the Beanin School of Music. Because the original manuscript doesn't give any indications of performance type of issues, you know, it doesn't have any dynamics, it doesn't have any phrase markings, or we decided to allow the performers to essentially come up with their own interpretation. It was so gratifying to hear them apply their interpretation and bring out melodies that were, were inside and uh, uh, shape the music with, with dynamics, with volumes, with soft sections and a little bit louder sections. It was a really a spectacular uh, coming together of what the students did with the resources that they were given. The caliber of students in the School of Music is exceptionally high. So we knew going in that handing this piece to a student group we were fairly certain we were going to end up with a good result and we did. There's not a whole lot of times you get the opportunity to play music without some kind of guide, without a performance tradition, without editing or anything like that. So, you know, going from nothing to a performance is a really interesting process. With an ensemble, to get four different people's ideas about the notes on a page and kind of put, bring them together and form one cohesive performance. We took sort of historical context into account, like we thought about giving it a French sound um, like maybe an airier quality. Overall, most decisions are made somewhat democratically. One person suggests one thing and we try it, and then if that doesn't work out, we try something else. Especially with something like a fugue, where your line itself is so important, it's just, it's four lines speaking in counterpoint. And I think it's really interesting to just take something like that that's completely fresh and make it your own. For me, mostly, it was just the experience of playing a piece that I knew had never been performed. I've never worked with any of those members before, and they're all people I really wanted to play with. Fugues are generally presented from the inside voices out, so the violist often gets that duty to present the fugue subject and give it the phrasing that is to be followed from then on. So I, I did have a sense of ownership over the musicality of at least that subject in that piece. This is my second degree at Northwestern, so this is my sixth year. The music school here has so many resources and the university itself has so many resources that even being here for two degrees, I haven't even tapped into everything. There's a really high level of playing here. You can't really ignore that. And you might as well consider it along with the conservatory. You know, it's also excellent to be immersed in an environment where you can do something else or um, like tag team with a different kind of program. This place attracts so diverse a, a musical crowd that it gives you the opportunity to see lots of different things and hear lots of different perspectives. A good aspect of Northwestern is that it's very career oriented. There's an emphasis here on learning your instrument and music as a way to get a job that you want in the future.
We also played the first movement of Ravel's F major string quartet. It's interesting to start working on the fugue and then move to the quartet, which all string players basically know. It's one of the standard great pieces. The quartet is extremely significant in Ravel's career because, first of all, this is his first major chamber work for strings and would be you know, a foundation for later compositions. And also because Ravel, even though he was a pianist by training, considered the string instruments to be the heart of the orchestra, the soul of the orchestra. Ravel was really greatly inspired to write the string quartet um, by a piece that had premiered in 1893, actually, which is the year of Ravel's first published work. And that quartet in 1893 was written by Claude Debussy, which is one of the most famous string quartets of the late 19th, early 20th centuries. The piece was written in many ways as Ravel's response to Debussy's quartet. It quickly became one of his most popular compositions. For the most part, the fugue and the quartet are separate pieces because they're written in very different styles. You're seeing the early days of Ravel's counterpoint ideas and kind of seeing if there's any connection there, which of course there is because it's his own studying into, into his finished product. And you can, you can see where his ideas about counterpoint come into play. There's a little coda little conclusion where Ravel goes from F minor into a sunny F major. And it's really fascinating to listen to that section, it's only about five bars or so, where he's a lot more free with his use of harmony than he has been most of the rest of the piece. And it definitely, there are parts of, of that conclusion in particular that are reminiscent of the quartet and of later pieces of Ravel's. The majority of the manuscript is remarkably clean. There are very little correction, but on the first page there are um, a number of corrections, especially in blue pencil. Doing some comparative examination, it's my opinion that they were corrections uh, by someone else. I believe it was the teacher he was working with at the time, André Jadage. Fugues are based on a main musical idea called a subject, which is presented in one part and then in the other parts. And so the composer can go in several different directions after they have actually responded to the subject, what's called the answer. So I believe that the corrections were there as Jadalge perhaps and Ravel sat down at some point and Jadalge looked at the solution that Ravel had come up with for that opening section of the fugue and offered some of his own suggestions. Since acquiring the fugue, uh, we've acquired three additional original Ravel manuscripts, which is pretty exciting just because there isn't a lot out there. It really takes an opportunity to present itself. The next step for, for the fugue is publishing it and make, making the fugue more widely available. Which would include a, a color reproduction of the score, some critical commentary, the, uh, from a historical standpoint and also from a theoretical standpoint about the piece. It's a really fascinating example of you know, a, a very simple musical idea, the subject that the fugue is based on. And it could have gone in many different directions, but Ravel does some really interesting things in the piece, especially with his use of harmony. I had really, in my mind, framed this as purely an academic exercise, devoid of anything that you would typically associate with Ravel. Ravel, we think of as a highly expressive composer, and here he is writing a fugue in this very confined academic style with lots of rules. Musically, I 
I, I didn't anticipate it would be so interesting. And even though he was very much constrained by having to work within a certain style, there are still moments of it that sound like Ravel. Maybe I shouldn't be surprised by that, that a composer of Ravel's stature and, and accomplishment, that even working within the uh, strict guidelines of an, of an academic assignment, um, he couldn't help but let his personality come through.